So given the uh, informal nature, overall nature of this uh, talk, please feel free to interrupt me at any given point in time. My understanding based on uh, what Joanna, Claire, and Julia told me is that all of you are just beginning to, sorry, uh, are just beginning to start your PhD. So Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah we can hear you now. Okay, sorry. For some reason, it's I suddenly uh, every, it looked like everything was muted. So yeah, let me just start by saying, please feel free to ask me questions at any point in time. I, you know, I have um, set up this talk in a way where I talk a little bit about my work, um, and you know, when I asked Claire for some guidance and how exactly to set up, she said, well, you know, talk a little bit about the big questions talk about where you come from, how you made decisions in your career, what the next step is, and uh, what do you look for and makes you satisfied as a scientist. Um, so I'm hoping to touch on all of these topics and sort of weave it into my science as well. I should say that this asks this one question of how did you make decisions in your career? In my case, I did not. It is just a series of accidents. You know, it's like, oh, it, it, the decisions were made by my failures, I should say. So, um, I, and hopefully that'll come through. All right, so yeah, so like I said, feel free to interrupt me at any point in time if you have any questions. So the talk of, you know, the title of my talk is Fish of, Fishing for Principles of Organization and Developing Spinal Motor Circuits. And what I thought I would do is give you a sense for um, some of the big questions here and all of the work that sort of led to the question that we addressed in this most recent paper that was published, where we looked at how inhibition is processed at the level of single neurons. And the idea here is um, to give you a sense for what led to me asking that question, um, and then also to give you a sense for how potentially that approach can be used in asking um, circuit level questions um, in other parts of the brain as well. So. So in terms of behavior, we, I was very interested in a very simple behavior, which is how do animals move at different speeds? Uh, let me see, there we go. Uh, why is my slide not moving? There we go, okay. So, you know, one of the simplest behaviors animals do is they just move at a broad range of speeds, right? So often most animals are moving at slow speeds for foraging and going about life as usual. But sometimes it's useful to be able to move at faster speeds, you know, sometimes for survival and sometimes for fun. So how is it that circuits in the spinal cord and the brain are organized to allow animals to move at different speeds? It's, it's obviously very essential for us to be able to do that, um, to, to be able to um, deal with different environmental contingencies, right? And so, We've been working on this, you know, motor control as a field for for over the last, you know, century or so, and we know that a lot of different parts of the brain are involved in this. So the basal ganglia, the cortex, the cerebellum, and the brainstem are all involved in initiating, learning, and and coordinating movements. But ultimately, all of this information is funneled down into the spinal cord, and that the, the circuits in the spinal cord activate motor neurons, which activate muscles. And so one of the big questions in neuroscience, or at least in motor control has been, well, how are circuits in the spinal cord organized to produce locomotion? You know, one of the key questions has been, is the spinal cord just a relay? You know, is it, is it just a servant to all the commands from the brain? Or is there processing taking place in the spinal cord that, um, that can shape how we move? So there are three um, key principles or key discoveries that I think have shaped the field um, in the form that it is now, and which have come about, you know, I think at gaps of about 50 years. So the very first um, one was work done by um, Sir Thomas Graham Brown at the University of Edinburgh. And what he basically showed was that in deafferented and decerebrated cats. So basically in cats where there is no descending input from the brain or any sensory input from the periphery, the cat 
muscles are still able to perform uh, rhythmic movements. And based on this, it was, he was well ahead of his time, he proposed a very simple model for alternation, which involved you know, an excitatory neuron or excitatory neurons on one side of the spinal cord activating motor neurons that can activate um, muscle. And then active, these excitatory neurons also turn on inhibition, which crosses over to the other side of the spinal cord and turns off um, antagonistic neurons. And so this very simple model of left-right alternation um, was useful to explain how simple vertebrates such as fish swim, you know, the, for left-right alternation, or for controlling the um, activity of antagonistic motor pools in limbed animals, say, such as biceps and triceps, right? So this was one key principle that um, that was um, Im that emerged early in the 1900s, and there's been more and more evidence for the existence of this basic circuit. Then the next key thing was, well, how do animals move at different speeds? And this was work done by Henneman in, in the 1950s. Um, and what Henneman discovered is that motor neurons in the spinal cord are recruited according to what's known as the size principle. And the basic idea is that the smallest motor neurons are active when animals just need to perform slow movements and progressively larger motor neurons are activated as animals need to move at strong, faster speeds. And what Henneman proposed uh, as a very sort of simple principle was that this these differences in sizes are in fact sufficient to, um, to control the activity of these neurons, suggesting that synaptic input to these neurons is not critical in shaping their output. And the reasoning behind that is a very basic biophysical property of neurons, which is that small motor neurons have a high input resistance, which means they're very sensitive to synaptic input whereas large motor neurons are, uh, have a lower input resistance. So for the same amount of synaptic input, they don't necessarily reach threshold. And so what Henneman proposed is that there is a, a uniform synaptic drive to all of these neurons. And when it's small, these motor neurons that, are, that have high input resistance and that innervate slow muscle, those are activated, but not the fast motor neurons. Um, but then as animals need to move faster, you increase excitation to the entire motor pool. And why this was a very attractive principle at that time was what it suggested is you don't necessarily need to have very fine-tuned synaptic connectivity to, to control the activity of motor neurons. And I think that my data and along with a lot of other work is now beginning to suggest that Henneman size principle was correct for sure, but the mechanisms that lead to this pattern of recruitment are far more complex than he, he um, thought. Then finally, I think one of the key discoveries in the last 20 years is work done by Tom Jessel in, um, in, the, in the mouse spinal cord. And what Tom's work showed was that the, that the neurons in the spinal cord of, uh, of all vertebrates arise from this conserved genetic program uh, and so this is a cross section of the spinal cord. And this genetic program is set up by a two counteracting gradients of these two proteins. And the specifics here don't matter, but the, uh, what Tom's work and, and all of his colleagues work showed is that this gradient sets up a um, gradient of progenitor domains that then spit out different classes of interneurons and motor neurons in the spinal cord. And what was really cool about this was that this um, program of setting up spinal interneurons is conserved across animals, right? Um, so which was really useful because as you can see, work in motor control had been done in a variety of different animals. So, you know, some of the original works say from Stan Grillner and Alan Roberts was done in these vertebrate models like lamprey and xenopus. Henneman's work was done in cats. And then the more recent work was done in, in, in mice. And how do you integrate? How do you find principles, shared principles across animals? Well, this genetic code ends up being a very useful way to begin to do that because you can say, well, you know, this transcription factor, this neuron that is driven by this trans transcription factor does say this function in this animal, what's it doing in another animal? And it begins to give us a sense for how these neurons might, how their functions might have been adapted as well as what functions are conserved for locomotion, right? But the other challenging part about um, 
all of the work that Jessel um, did, um, Jessel's lab did, was it, <laughs> it revealed this complexity, right? It now, it was almost this embarrassment of riches now. There are all these cell types in the spinal cord. What are they doing? Because, you know, based on the simple model of alternation, why do you need all these neurons? And then if Henneman was correct about not needing a very sophisticated descending control of motor neurons, if it was just tonic drive, well, why have all these neurons, right? And I think that's been one of the challenging aspects of the field is trying to figure out what all these neurons are doing. And so the traditional approach to which this has been um, trying to do knockouts, right? You, you ablate different populations of neurons and then you see how animals move. And, and that's been a very fruitful and productive approach to trying to understand the functional roles of these neurons. But what was lacking is uh, uh, for a true mechanistic understanding of circuits, uh, you, know, you know, if you wanted to build a computational model, for instance, we don't have any idea, or we still had limited ideas to how these neurons are connected to, um, to give rise to behavior. And so the approach I took was, was a little different, and I, um, which reveals my biases, which, which was to try and understand how this information is processed at the level of single neurons. So we know that from a lot of previous work, you know, starting from um, Cajal's work, we know that neurons have these very complex structures, right? So this is a Purkinje neuron with this very complex dendritic arbor. This is a cat motor neuron with all of these very complex dendritic arbors. And these neurons receive tens of thousands of inputs. So we thought, and by we, I mean uh, me and Dave, um, we thought that why, why not look at the information that these individual cells are receiving at different speeds of movement to try and understand if there is any logic to that. And if that gives us a sense for why there might be such a wide diversity of neurons. Okay, and I think hopefully that'll become clearer as I uh, go along in my talk. So I think I'm preaching to the choir here when I talk about zebrafishes uh, as a good model and as a model for motor control, but let me just quickly talk about some of the things that make it especially useful. So as all of you know, I mean, I think everyone here works with larval zebrafish. They're transparent, they're compact. Uh, from a motor control perspective, they're um, useful just from this idea of being able to perform simple behaviors at a variety of intensities. Um, so this is a video of um, of a larval zebrafish tracking this paramecia. And I think many of you work on this, so this should not, um, you, I'm, you're all familiar with these very subtle maneuvers that these fish perform, um, even by the time that they're um, five days old as they orient themselves towards the prey. So even at this very early stage in development, they have a sophisticated um, motor infrastructure to be able to go after to these prey, right? But sometimes all you need to do is to survive. And so here's a video, and I'll play that again, of uh, zebrafish being attacked by this Daphnia larva, right? And you'll see that it performs this very strong escape bend and pr propulsive movements. So already by this very young stage in its life, these fish are able to escape animals, uh, but also perform very fairly sophisticated movements to be able to go capture prey. And if we schematize this, their bodies, you know, their, their movements look like this, which is basically a progression of um, muscle activity from rostral, from head to tail, um, which alternates from left to right. And the, the key difference is that, that fast movements, you have um, stronger bends on either side, whereas slower movements have more subtle left-right um, alternation. So this is, of course, the behavioral advantage of using zebrafish for addressing um, key questions in uh, motor control. And, and the one that I'm most interested in is, well, how are these circuits processing um, information to move at different speeds, right? The other advantage, as you all know, is, of course, the genetic tools. So you can, um, you can genetically modify fish to express uh, transgenes in different sets of neurons very much like in Drosophila and in mice. And so here you see a transgenic line, and this is a lateral view of 
the cord. And I'm sorry if I talk about the orientation of zebrafish. I know you are all very familiar with this, but I'm often talking to audiences that are Drosophila or mice. So, um, but just to orient you, this is the, the eye, this is the tail, and this is a transgenic motor, uh, transgenic line where all the motor neurons express GFP. And you can see uh, their innervation out in the muscle. Right, and then if we zoom in into just a couple of segments of the spinal cord, we see all these motor neurons, and it's a halo around the cell body because the transgenic line um, is a membrane tag GFP, which means it just it, you know it's just uh, the GFP is localized to the membranes of these cell bodies and their axons and dendrites, and they at, in each segment these motor neurons um, their axons fasciculate and and exit the spinal cord um, in a, in, and that's known as the ventral route. And that's useful just from a physiological perspective because as you'll see later, we use the information coming out of that route to assess how fast fish are swimming, okay? All right, so before I get into my work, right? So the big question I wanted to understand is, well, how do cells in the spinal cord integrate information? Uh, and is there any logic to it? And so how do I get to that, right? You know, where, where, where did I start to, why, why get interested in this relatively obscure thing that, you know, my family still wonders why I study fish. So, um, so what led, down, led me down to this path? So I um, grew up in India, in, in the capital in New Delhi. Uh, and I did my uh, um, high school and my college education there. And when I was, um, sort of in high school, I got interested in biology, but for no clear reason. And, you know, my, my parents are, um, my mom's a physicist and my dad's um, an engineer. And so they always wanted me to study physics and math. So biology was my sort of rebellion, you know? It was like, oh, okay, I'm gonna study biology. So you know, that was my teenage rebellion. But I didn't really have an idea for why it was that I was studying biology. It, was, it seemed interesting, it seemed cool, but, I didn't necessarily have a framework for it. And so I kind of stumbled into an undergraduate um, degree in biochemistry. At that time, one had the option of doing zoology or botany, um, but there were a few colleges that offered a major in biochemistry. So I said, well, that seems interesting. So I got into that and I absolutely hated my first year of college because it was just this didactic transfer of information right there was no joy it was just like this this just transfer of facts but luckily for me i discovered this book by a classic biochemistry textbook by a guy called trier and it was one of the most beautiful textbooks i've come across and it had all this really cool stuff and protein structures and it was really around that time that i truly began to enjoy biology and it around the same time I don't remember how, but I was exposed to Jane Goodall's documentaries on chimpanzee behavior, and, uh, and I was enamored. I thought, oh, you know, it'd be really cool to go study chimp behavior. And I read a book around that time, which was a popular science book called The Beak of the Finches, uh, which talked about the evolution of um, beaks of, Dar of finches on Galapagos that had been studied by Darwin. So there was this sort of convergence of interest from a, from a very biochemistry point of view and evolution. And, and for me, evolution was the, was the framework that then allowed me to sort of merge my different interests in biology. So I thought, oh, you know, it'd be really cool to study evolution. And so to do that, and since I was very interested in protein structures, I spent a year right after my undergrad with these two scientists, Sadhamani and Srinivasan, and this was at the National Center for Biological Sciences in Bangalore. And I said, oh, you know, well, let me do some um, computational work, which was, and what they basically were interested in was trying to understand how do you predict protein structure from protein sequences? And I thought, um, I'd, I'd hardly ever done any experiments. So I thought I'm going to be absolutely lousy at doing experiments. So let me do some computational work. So I spent a year in their labs doing this work and it was fun and it was cool, but it was also, I realized pretty quickly not what I wanted to do and I, while I was at that institute, heard some neuroscience talks, and I thought, oh, this is really cool. So what I really want to study is the neuroscience of, uh, or, or how have brains evolved, right? So that, so I applied on a whim to a bunch of neuroscience um, PhD programs in the US at the time with absolutely no background in neuroscience. I did not, I barely knew how a neuron functioned. 
And so with that in mind, I, uh, you know, applied to a bunch of programs and then got accepted in a program at uh, Stony Brook University, which had a joint program at Cold Spring Harbor at that time. And so, you know, I landed in Stony Brook in uh, 2002, I think. Yeah. So a while back and I absolutely it was a it was a culture shock to say the least because you needed a car to get everywhere uh and i absolutely uh, and stony brook the university here on long island is it's nestled in a very rich wealthy community which is not very conducive to life as a, as a grad student so i was pretty miserable my first year in uh, graduate school um, in the us you know culturally trying to figure out where i fit in and and also just in in, in terms of neuroscience because even though I was interested in the evolution of nervous systems, very quickly from coursework, I began to find out that, oh, um, we don't really know much about how nervous systems function. So I think trying to figure out how they evolve is, is a whole different challenge. Luckily for me at this time, Stony Brook's neuroscience program had this really cool uh, program where you didn't necessarily need to do rotations. You just spent a couple of days, a weekend in each lab. And when I was doing this, I came across Joe Fecho's lab. Um, and Joe at that time was just beginning to um, develop transgenic zebrafish. And, you know, I was enamored. Like, I, I remember seeing these fish under the, under the microscope and suddenly the nervous system became much more tractable. I was like, oh, I can see these neurons. The animal's transparent. You know, this is the is it. This is the system that I want to work on. And it really helped that Joe himself is a very larger than life personality. So he was, it was just a fun place to be in. So that the two um, intersected in, in sort of me getting interested in zebrafish, even though I wasn't interested in motor control per se at that time. And Joe was really cool because he's like, well, you don't have to study motor control. You know, I think we can use these animals to study a lot of different questions. So that's how I got started in Joe's lab. Luckily for me, also at that time, Joe got hired by Cornell. So we got to leave Stony Brook and move up to Ithaca, um, which is this idyllic town, you know, very small population. And I grew up in Delhi, which had, you know, a population of 18 million people. And then I went to Ithaca, which has a population of 50,000 people. And it was a beautiful town. So I had a really great time and I uh, am thankful that I got that opportunity. So when I was in Joe's lab, sort of pivoting back to science now, I was really interested in, I was becoming really interested in plasticity and learning and memory. And so Joe suggested that I take up this project that others had tried but hadn't really been able to sort of bring to fruition was this idea of how do um, molecules that are involved in learning and memory what are they doing in, in zebrafish at, at different times? And so one of the big molecules at that time was a molecule called chamkinase 2. And so we studied, uh, Joe's idea was, well, let's express chamkinase 2 tagged with GFP and see when the fish are trying to do learning, uh, are, are learning new behaviors, how the chamk 2 distributes in different neurons. And in principle, that sounded like a great idea. I spent three years, um, made some transgenic lines, but we discovered that zebrafish, larval zebrafish, don't really seem to learn a whole lot at that age. And so that was a huge hindrance. And so after about three years of working on that project, you know, I um, was like, oh, this isn't going anywhere. I need to do something new. And at this same time, um, I was getting really interested in some of the work that was being done in Steve Smith's lab where they were looking at the structure of individual neurons. And I said, well, why not do that in the spinal cord of zebrafish? What is the structure of neurons in the spinal cord of zebrafish? So I began expressing GFP in individual motor neurons. Um, and what we found in these developing animals is if you so I'll play a video is, uh, let's see, this, yeah. So you can see this, this is an individual neuron expressing GFP and that's been imaged in 3D um, in, a, in, in vivo. Um, and what we saw was that they had very interesting dynamics, right? So, oops, let me see if I can replay that video. There you go. So I hope you can see these very small movements of dendrite. So this was very cool to me. And, you know, I needed a thesis project, so I... <laughs> use this, characterize these dynamics of, uh, of these uh, dendrites and saw very interesting patterns in how these dendrites um, develop and um, 
in their relation to activity. But what was more important was that it began to give me tools to really look at the structure of individual neurons. And so here you see an individual neuron, motor neuron, where that expresses, that's expressing red fluorescent protein. And so you can look at the detailed structure of the neuron and it's expressing PSD95 tagged with GFP. So PSD95 is a protein that localizes to excitatory synapses. So um, we could see where synapses are. So, you know, to me, this was really cool because it began to give us a handle on can we begin to understand how information is processed at the level of single neurons in the spinal cord, which is something that no one was doing at the time. Um, luckily for me, I mean, and, you know, imaging at that time wasn't going to be a, um, a uh, we didn't yet have the tools to use imaging to address this problem. So electrophysiology seemed like a more tractable approach, which is what then led me to come for my postdoc to go from Joe's lab to Dave McLean's lab. Now, this is a little incestuous because Dave was a postdoc in Joe's lab. Um, and Dave had done this really cool work in uh, Joe's lab, looking at the organization of circuits in the zebrafish spinal cord. Um, so I, I'm going to switch to my main project now. Does anyone have any questions that, uh, you know, anything you want to ask at this point? If not, I will proceed. Okay. So I came to Dave's lab to learn electrophysiology because Dave had done uh, really cool work with physiology. And I'll very quickly summarize his work and how we do physiology. And so the way we do physiology in zebrafish is we paralyze them, which basically blocks the neuromuscular junction, but leaves the activity in the spinal cord intact. We pin the zebrafish, uh, we pin the larva on their sides using these pins here, and we dissect out a small muscle segment so that then the spinal cord is accessible and the fish are completely alive and, and um, able to produce so-called fictive movements at this time. And so we can then bring in an electrode and record from individual neurons and bring in a second electrode and record from the ventral nerve uh, that exits the spinal cord. And we can make the fish swim just by giving a brief tail stimulus. And what did the data look like? Um, so on top, the trace that you see here are action potentials of the neurons that neuron that is being recorded from. And at, at the bottom is the ventral root discharge from the motor nerve. And so the frequency of this discharge gives us a sense for how fast the fish is swimming. And these action potentials, when the neuron's active, gives us a sense for when the neuron is active in relation to the speed at which the fish is swimming. So as you can see here, these neurons are, this particular neuron is active at fast speeds of locomotion but um, is not active at slow speeds of locomotion. So using experiments like this, Dave found some really cool patterns, which is um, what he saw was that motor neurons in the zebrafish spinal cord are organized in this fashion, topographic fashion, where the most ventral motor neurons are active at the slowest speeds of locomotion, and progressively more dorsal ones are active at faster speeds of locomotion. And he found the same pattern for excitatory neurons that drive these motor neurons. And then it was a flip pattern for inhibitory neurons, such that the most dorsal inhibitory neurons are the ones active at slow speeds of locomotion. And progressively more ventral ones are active at fast speeds of locomotion. Okay, So this set the groundwork for then beginning to look at, well, how might these neurons be talking to each other? right? Um, and my focus was on these inhibitory interneurons, so these commissural neurons that sort of cross over from one side of the spinal cord to the other to silence them. And I was interested in understanding the, the nature of connectivity of these inhibitory neurons. Okay. So to remind you, the question I was really interested in is, is there a functional logic to the synaptic organization at the level of single neurons? And so my work was really inspired by a lot of the work that's been done in the cortex um, and the cerebellum, where we know that there is a vast diversity of inhibitory neurons that target different compartments of uh, neurons. So here's a schematic uh, from a review from Josh Wang's group in 2007. And what you see in red is a pyramidal neuron, which are the principal excitatory neurons in the cortex. And then a lot of work um, has shown that you have distinct classes of inhibitory neurons. Uh, 
that target distinct compartments. So you have the axon initial segment, that tar uh, the chandelier cells that target the axon initial segment, basket cells that target the somata, and you have these other cells that target the dendrites. And from a computational sense, this is really interesting, right? Because inhibition that's a, that arrives at the soma or the axon has the ability to have a very potent effect just from the basic biophysics of neurons on controlling the activity of these neurons. Whereas inhibition that arrives in dendrites tends to be or might be weaker by the, times it, by the time it arrives at the soma. So what are all these different neurons doing and why are there all these different neurons that target different compartments? So, so this has been an open question in the cortex and in the cerebellum for a while. But functionally, it's really hard to get at that in, in the cortex because we don't yet fully have a detailed understanding of what the functional roles of these neurons are. So my idea was to see if there might be similar organizational patterns in the zebrafish spinal cord and can we link it to function because we have a very simple readout of function, right? Slow and fast movement. So are there neurons that target different compartments of motor neurons that are related to the speed at which they're act? So with this in mind, we were sort of broke down this question into three more specific questions. Well, how are inhibitory synapses distributed in motor neurons, first and foremost? Um, do different inhibitory neurons synapse onto different compartments of motor neurons? And then finally, is there a correlation between inhibitory neuron uh, structure and function? And while in, in the process of addressing this, we actually went back in development and found some interesting developmental patterns as well. So I'll, I'll hopefully um, show you how going back in development is actually a useful tool to, to get at nervous system function. Okay, so how are inhibitory neurons distributed in motor neurons is the very first question we wanted to ask. And the reason we needed to do that was to get a sense of what the spatial patterns of distribution are so that we get a spatial framework to look at whether presynaptic inhibitory neurons are targeting different compartments. So to do that, we use a simple, fairly simple genetic strategy that's especially easy to do in zebrafish. So um, Joe Fecho's lab had developed a construct where they had tagged the glycine receptor um, subunit alpha-1 with GFP, which meant that um, expressing this in individual neurons, it would get localized to presumptive glycinergic synapses uh, in individual motor neurons. So the experiment we did was we, would, we injected a uh, motor neuron driver along with um, a driver to drive the expression of red fluorescent protein, as well as the ability to drive um, this glycine receptor tagged with GFP. And by injecting this at the single cell stage in zebrafish, we can stick Fantastically label individual neurons, and this is what the data look like. Uh, so this is an individual neuron, a primary motor neuron, which uh, the, the detail doesn't matter, but this we know that this is active at the fastest speeds of movement. And what you see here in magenta is the structure of the neuron. So you can see these are the dendrites, that's the somata, and that's the axon before it exits the spinal cord. And the green puncta are these glycine receptors tagged with GFP. And so they give us a sense for the overall distribution of synapses. So you can see that in this neuron, there is this very high density of synapses in the soma and on the axon initial segment, and a lower density of synapses on the dendrite. Now, when we look at this, so this is a lateral view of the, of the motor neuron. When we look at this in the coronal view, um, it gives us a sense for the spatial distribution of these synapses, right? And to compare um, fish, compare neurons across fish, we can normalize the distribution of these synapses along the mediolateral axis and the dorsal ventral axis of the spinal cord using landmarks in the spinal cord. And so what you see here is that synapses on the, on the axon are located medially and ventrally, and then you have more dorsally displaced somatic synapses, whereas dendritic synapses are more lateral in the spinal cord. Now, when we pool all of these data, we can digitize this um, and essentially come up with XYZ coordinates for each of these synapses and then normalize them to the spinal cord. And when we pool all of this data across a large number of neurons, motor neurons, we can see that so axonic synapses, and what you're seeing here are contour plots that give you a sense of the distribution of these synapses. So the innermost contours represent the highest density and the outermost contours represent lower density. So 
Synapses on the axons of motor neurons are typically located ventrally and medially. Synapses on the somata are located more dorsally. Uh, and then you have synapses in the lateral neural pill of, um, um, in the spinal cord. So with this um, spatial framework in mind, we can now begin to ask, well, do different inhibitory neurons target these different compartments, right? So our first very crude approach was to look at the structure of individual inhibitory neurons in the background of a transgenic line where motor neurons express GFP. So here, what you see, I'll show you three videos. Um, what you see are, is a transgenic line where all of the motor neurons are expressing GFP. And what we've done is we've injected, um, uh, we've injected RFP so that it's expressed in individual inhibitory neurons. So we can look at the structure of that inhibitory neuron in relation to all of these motor neurons. So what you'll see in this video is first a lateral view, then a dorsal view, and then I'll slice through this video, okay? So here we go. So from the dorsal view, you can see that the individual neuron crosses over from one side. And then as we slice through, we see that this neuron very specifically makes synapses onto the axon initial segments, uh, or at least it's arborizing very close to the axon initial segments, right? And let me play that video just once more. Um, so there you see the axon crossing over, and then that's the structure of the neuron and you can see where it's synapsing. So this was cool because we we first saw the structure uh, that was very specifically innervating just the axon and initial segments. And this neuron had been characterized before. So this wasn't a new discovery per se. But then what we found is that there are other neurons that specifically seem to target the somata. So now this is the same experiment and you can see that this particular neuron has these axons that very specifically seem to target the somata of motor neurons, yeah? And then finally, we looked at neurons that have, um, that seem to arborize largely in the dendritic neural pill. So as you look through the lateral view, you'll see that most of this, um, the, ar the axon just seems to arborize in the lateral neural pill off the, off the motor neuron neural pill. So this was really cool to us because what this told us is, Oh, there are not only different inhibitory neurons, but they're actually, they actually seem to be targeting different compartments of motor neurons. But as anyone will tell you, um, this is just simply morphology. It doesn't actually tell us that these neurons are connected, right? They may be connected to a number of other things. This is simply correlation. So the next step that we did to actually sort of begin to get a connectivity was again to use a genetic technique where we now use synaptophysin tagged with GFP, where synaptophysin localizes to the output sites of neurons. So by using the same approach as we did before, but now using three colors instead of two, we can label individual inhibitory neurons so we can look at their structure. We can label um, using synaptophysin GFP the output sites of those neurons in a transgenic line where all of the motor neurons express blue fluorescent protein. And by using the same approach that we did to, clap, to quantify the distribution of um, the glycine receptors on the postsynaptic side, we did the same for this neuron. And when we do that, we can see that this particular neuron has synapses that are specifically distributed ventrally and medially, right? And so by sampling a large number of neurons, we find that three classes of neurons. Neurons that seem to arborize ventrally and laterally, neurons that seem to have their synapses be medially but spread out more along the dorsoventral extent, and then other neurons, inhibitory neurons, that um, have their synapses more out in the lateral neuropil. And this, when superimposed in the distribution of glycinergic synapses, showed us that these overlap pretty nicely with the distinct axoaxonic, somatic, and dendritic synapses on motor neurons, right? So this was, again, really cool because this told us, well, these are, in fact, there is at least the potential for these neurons to make connections to these motor neurons. Now, as a final step to use microscopy to sort of get at connectivity, we used a technique called GRASP, which um, allows us to label uh, both presynaptic and postsynaptic structures. And the idea is we split GFP, 
one half of GFP is in a presynaptic neuron and the other half of GFP is in a postsynaptic neuron. And the GFP hangs out on the outsides of these neurons so whenever the GFP is really close to each other, the two halves of GFP are really close to each other, they form a functional GFP molecule that fluoresces. So indicative of um, a potential synapse, right? So this is the closest we can come to looking at potential synapses short of doing EM, right? So we used uh, GRASP to um, look at, well, where are these synapses on motor neurons, specifically by driving one half of GFP in a class of inhibitory neurons that are um, that play a role in alternation. And that specific detail is not critical. This particular DI6 is not necessarily critical for this talk. And what we found is by using this approach that, in fact, yes, there are synapses on the axons of motor neurons. So what you see here in blue is the axon of a motor neuron. In purple or in magenta is the inhibitory neuron. And these distinct puncta represent the synapses, uh, or at least putative synapses between these. So using this approach, we find yet more evidence that there are, in fact, axoaxonic, perisomatic, and dendritic um, synapses onto motor neurons from the from inhibitory neurons all right so now this was a whole amount of a uh, whole bunch of anatomical and and in vivo data to suggest that there are distinct neurons that that perform uh, or at least that innervate distinct compartments of motor neurons but is there any relevance to function right are are these actually at all uh is this just a does this distribution actually have anything to do with function? function. So to do this, we actually looked back in development. And early on in development, when zebrafish are just two days old, they only perform reflexive movements. So they perform these very fast ballistic movements. And what we'd known from previous work is that motor neurons at that time, they lack dendrites largely, right? So you're looking at a lateral view of the motor neuron, that's the soma, that's the axon. And you can see the beginnings of a dendrite, but they largely lack dendritic structure. By the time fish are um, they acquire the ability to swim at slower speeds, motor neuron dendrites elaborate substantially over the same time, right? So this led us to wonder, well, is it possible that the circuitry that is set up early that mediates this fast swimming is plugging into the somata, whereas circuitry that emerges later um, is, is plugging into dendrites, right? So and we wanted to focus specifically on inhibitory neurons because that was the that was the question I was asking. So to do that, we needed to look at the time, the time course of the development of inhibitory neurons. And we used a genetic technique where we expressed a photoconvertible protein called dendra. Uh, and we made a transgenic line where all of these inhibitory neurons that are involved in commercial inhibition express this photoconvertible protein dendra. And the way that strategy works is we make that transgenic, we take that transgenic line and we photoconvert all of these neurons. So the way dendra works is when you illuminate uh, the protein with UV, it goes from fluorescing green to fluorescing red. And so we take these fish that are expressing um, dendra in these inhibitory neurons and photoconvert them just by exposure to UV light. Then we take the fish out let them swim around for a few days and then image them at a later stage in development. And what that tells us when we image them at day five is now there are two populations of neurons. Neurons that exclude, that, that express only, um, or that are fluorescing only red and the neurons that are fl fluorescing green. Um, and so basically the neurons that are fluorescing red were the ones that were present at the time when the fish was photoconverted Whereas the neurons that are um, fluorescing green are the ones that emerged after day two, right? So by using this approach, what we found is that there are in fact inhibitory neurons that um, emerge early, and then a whole bunch of neurons that emerge later in development that, that shown here in green. And so this is a lateral view of the spinal cord. Now, when we look at a coronal view of this distribution of these neurons, uh, we find that these neurons that emerge later are typically uh, located more dorsally and medially, whereas neurons that were born early in development are ventral and more lateral. And if we quantify this distribution using contour plots, we find again that these younger neurons, later born neurons are medial and dorsal, whereas um, early neurons are um, more ventral and, and lateral. And this was really interesting to us because Dave's previous work had shown 
that these inhibitory neurons that are located dorsally are active at slow speeds, whereas inhibitory neurons located at um, more ventrally are active at fast speeds. So this led us to wonder, well, are these neurons that are located more ventrally, the ones that are contacting the somata of motor neurons, and the neurons that are located more dorsally, are they contacting the dendrites of neurons? So now we began to do some uh, physiology experiments, right? Um, yeah, so just to summarize, you know, this is what Dave's work had shown, that you have these inhibitory neurons that cross over that are active at slow speeds more dorsally. And what my data seemed to suggest is that these were born later in development. So where might they be plugging into their postsynaptic targets, in, in this case, motor neurons, right? So to do that, we started doing paired patch clamp recordings. And I won't bother you with the details of this. These were difficult experiments. So when I first started doing them, uh, I was getting, you know, we were, the experiment entails simultaneously recording from neurons on one side of the spinal cord and um, from inhibitory neurons on one side of the spinal cord and motor neurons on the other side of the spinal cord. And so when I first started doing these experiments, I was getting, um, well, I think for the first two months, I didn't get any data. Um, and then I started getting maybe one pair a week. And then, you know, with practice, and that's really cool about our brain, you know, we, I could get up to say five pairs a day. So it, it said that the data started coming in uh, faster with time. And the really useful part about doing these experiments by recording from two neurons simultaneously is what you're seeing here is an, act, is an inhibitory neuron and here a, the motor neuron. And the inhibitory neuron here is in current clamp mode. So we can look at the action potentials. When is the neuron active? And the motor neuron here is in voltage clamp where we're isolating inhibitory currents and we can just look at the patterns of inhibition in relation to when, this, when these neurons are active. And so by doing these experiments, we found three broad categories. Oh, sorry, and I should say that the other huge advantage of this is we can actually test for connectivity. Whether this neuron, if we trigger an action potential in this neuron, do we see a postsynaptic response in the motor neuron we're recording from? So not only do we get a sense for the speed at which these neurons are active and when they're active, we also get a sense for the amplitude and, and the, the, whether they're connected at all. So finally, we could fill these in individual inhibitory neurons with dye and then look at where they arborize, right? So by using this, and that's a lot of information, and I'm happy to answer more details about this uh, later on because I realize a lot of you are doing computational work, so you may not have actually done these techniques. But using this approach, what we found is that there are in fact three categories of neurons. Uh, inhibitory neurons, neurons that are active right at the onset of swimming when we poke the fish with, um, with a brief stimulus and fish are swimming really fast. And these are connected and then they arborize typically in the, um, in the ventral and uh, medial region, which is where the axoaxonic synapses are. Then neurons that are active at faster speeds that arborize more medially uh, where the somatic synapses are. And then finally, neurons that are active at slow speeds that arborize more in the lateral neuropil, which is where the dendritic synapses are, right? And so what we found is that there is, in fact, a correlation between the, um, between the structure and function. So neurons that are active at the fastest speeds are innervating the axon initial segments. Neurons that are active at more intermediate speeds are innervating the somata. And the neurons that are active at slower speeds are innervating the dendrites. And why might this be the case? So one key thing is as fish move at different speeds, the burden of alternating increases dramatically and the precision, spike timing precision needs to be greater at faster speeds. So you can imagine as fish are swimming slowly, there is more time for the information to go from one side to the other. But as fish swim faster, cells on the other side need to be silenced very quickly. And what, way, what better way to do it than to place the synapse on the axon initial segment where it can have a very potent impact on silencing it. Because imagine if you didn't have that inhibition, instead of moving, the fish would just sort of co-contract and just stay in the same place, right? 
So to summarize all of this, what we found is that there is this comp compartmental organization of inhibition that emerges during development. So early on in development, when fish are performing reflexive swimming, motor neurons shown here in gray lack dendrites, right? Um, and at the same time, you have these inhibitory neurons that develop that um, target the axon initial segments in the perisomatic regions of motor neurons. By the time fish begin to perform these more subtle maneuvers, you have a later population of, well, first of all, you have the dendrites of motor neurons emerge, and then you have a later population of inhibitory neurons that we think that then get targeted to dendrites, right? So just staggering the development of neurons and their postsynaptic structure facilitates this mapping that then plays a very key functional role in ensuring left-right alternation. So to finally summarize um, this, the key points, um, so you have different commercial inhibitory neurons that target the axon initial segment, the soma and the dendrite, which leads to a mapping of speed to motor neuron compartments and just a temporal development, at least in zebrafish, a temporal development sort of converts to a functional map of inhibition. Now, I just want to say thanks to the many people that have helped, you know, Dave McLean, who is my boss, who has been incredibly patient. Like I said, there were lots of detours in this project, many things that didn't work. And Dave was like, yeah, you know, keep plugging away. So uh, there was never a moment where he wasn't supportive. And that's one of the best things you can ask from your mentor. And of course, he has substantial intellectual and technical insights. So that's always very helpful too. Martha Bagnell, who was very key, critical in uh, teaching me electrophysiology um, along with Dave, but she introduced voltage clamp to the lab. And that ended up being a very powerful tool for us to, um, to really look at connectivity and look at patterns of inhibition and excitation. Eli was very instrumental and in, he was an undergrad um, and I realized at this time that I actually enjoy mentoring students. So he was an undergrad who really helped me uh, take the GRASP system from um, Drosophila and apply it in zebrafish. Shinichi, which I think all of you know is one of the pioneers of transgenic techniques in, in, um, in uh, zebrafish. Wei Jing, who was a former grad student of Dave's who was someone who's uh, uh, I could always reach out to just for bouncing ideas and questions. Joe, who is is Joe, I, if those of you who have interacted with Joe just know that he's, he's just an incredibly generous mentor who's continued to help beyond my PhD. And finally, Elissa, who uh, was a very willing and generous fish care technician. And with the numbers of crosses I requested, I don't think even once did she complain. And, you know, that's a huge, huge asset. I cannot downplay how important that is to be able to get work done. And finally, uh, there are a lot of personal detours. So that's my wife, my kid, and my dog. And they are fun to be with, but they can also sometimes slow science down. So this is all just to say that it's, it's, it's a lot of fun to do it, but um, uh, it's, it's also finding... Uh, one of the key lessons from my postdoc has been to try to find a balance between living life and doing science. And it's, it's not a lesson easily learned, but luckily I have a very patient wife. So it's been, uh, it's been somewhat easy to do. All right, so with that, I'm happy to take uh, any questions you have. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Sandeep. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so I have